Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video tackling one of our top 10 lists. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure that you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Today we'll discuss 10 rules for Bible interpretation. Not every Christian is a Bible scholar, but we should all be Bible students. And if we're going to take our study seriously, we should benefit from the many who have gone before us in exploring the Word. In the process, they've come up with some good rules for interpreting the book of books. Let's try to love God with all our minds today as we think about this. Let's go ahead and get started. Rule number one to Bible interpretation, Christ is the rule. Yes, all scripture speaks of Christ. And so we should look at him first and foremost, and we should understand that this is the important key. When you see Christ in the passage, he will explain to you the meaning of it. And in that beautiful story in Luke's gospel, we come to the end of the chapter, this, this two discouraged disciples, they're on their way to Emmaus, and uh, the Lord appears to them, but they don't recognize him, and they're very discouraged. And we read here in verse 27, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And by their own confession sometime later, they said, didn't our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and opened to us the scriptures? So they understood the opening of the scriptures to their eyes came because he revealed himself to them. He was the expositor, but he was also the exposition. He was the teacher and the teaching. And when we see Christ as both the teacher and the teaching, that's when the word of God opens to us. Our second rule is the golden rule of Bible study, which is what? It's been put this way, if the plain sense makes common sense, seek no other sense. Uh, there may be spiritual applications to be made from a given passage, but first we should understand the proper interpretation. In other words, what did the passage mean to the original author and the original readers? Now, when people say, do you take the Bible literally? The answer is, well, yes and no. We take it in its plain and obvious sense, unless otherwise indicated. Because obviously the Bible, being a great piece of literature, has metaphorical language, it has all sorts of figures of speech that we have to take seriously. When Jesus said, I am the door, he didn't expect us to think he was a piece of wood. On the other hand, he is a real door. He is the way in to certain things. And so what we know about doors forces us to think at a higher level that this actually is a door, but not a literal door. It's a metaphorical door, but it's a real door just the same. Number three, the definition rule. We need to carefully uncover the meaning of these words. So sometimes a word like meno in the Gospel of John is translated remain or continue or abide. It's the same Greek word, but as it's used in different contexts, we have to understand the flavor of meaning that that particular word is being used in that context. So we need to have some Bible study helps like a Vines Dictionary, a Strong's Concordance, or some Bible software, and by looking up the word, we find how it's used in other places. And we string together, we start with a working definition, and then we don't adjust our understanding of the verses, we adjust the word definition until it begins to match the way the word of God uses that particular word. And then number four, the application rule. And you hinted a little bit that interpretation and application are different. So how does this tie in? Well, we could say that all of the Bible is written for us. All of it is inspired and all of it is profitable. But not all of the Bible was written to us. 
So there are certain passages, for example, when God makes certain promises to Abraham. Or there are certain curses that are brought on the nation of Israel. These are not applied in the New Testament to us. We may draw certain principles from them, but the actual words themselves, while there may be an application to us, the basic interpretation applies to someone else. And this is very important. Many errors are uh, developed in our Bible study because we don't distinguish between Israel and the church and the kingdom. There is overlap, but these are distinct groups. And if we apply certain ideas, for example, uh, take not your Holy Spirit from me, which David prays in Psalm 51, that's not a problem for the Christian because the Spirit has sealed us until the day of redemption. In the Old Testament, the Spirit came upon certain individuals to move them in God's purposes. Some of them were saved people, some were not, like King Saul. In the New Testament, only the believers have the Spirit indwelling them. So that's an important distinction to make when we're studying the Word of God. Then we have number five, the context rule. Well, they say a text without a context is a pretext. In other words, we are presuming too much if we're not seeing the verse in its proper context. As I say, there's always an immediate context. How does this verse fit with the verses beside it? And then there is a context within the book, and then a context within the whole Bible. And when we're reading, we have to carefully determine how the context informs our understanding of that particular verse. Someone will quote, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And they think, well, this obviously means that God, through Christ, has selected certain individuals to be saved. But when we read it in its context, we discover that he's including Judas Iscariot. And on another occasion, he said, have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil. So obviously he didn't choose them for salvation. That was chosen for a role. And we can understand that from the context. You can take a whole book out of context. This was Martin Luther's problem. He misunderstood the book of James, called it a straw epistle, because he didn't understand how it fit in with the Apostle Paul's teaching. So in Ephesians 2, we read, By grace you're saved through faith, not of works. James seems to teach that we are justified by works. But if we read a little further in Paul's passage in Ephesians 2, he immediately says that we are saved for good works, which God designed before that we should walk in them. And so actually Paul and James do agree if we look at the wider context. So understanding the context is essential if we're going to be consistent, rightly dividing the word of truth. Next we have number six, the rules of mention. Now the rules of mention only work because the Bible is primarily not a chronological record. It is a thematic unfolding. So it's what's called a progressive revelation. Um, with a little bit, right, little by little, line upon line, precept upon precept. In other words, it's a book of order, it's a book of structure, principles are laid down and then added to, and the work, the ideas continue to grow. Because of that, we understand that the first mention of something is very often significant. It's like the old lady who puts the key under the mat at the door and puts a note on the door, the key is under the mat, so you can get in, right? God very often puts the key under the mat. He lets us know right at the beginning. So, for example, if I ask the question, what is the primacy of love? What's the main idea in love? If I go back to the first time it's mentioned, it's not the love of a man for his wife, it's the love of a father for his son. The son whom you love, God speaks about Abraham and Isaac. And so this is the supreme love, the love of God the Father for his Son in the bond of the Spirit. When we read about feet washing, we might assume that it's because people's feet got dirty on the dusty roads and they were reclining in proximity to others and needed their feet washed for sanitary reasons. But when we go back to the original story about feet washing with Abraham washing the feet of these heavenly visitors, 
The word is refresh yourself. And so the primary purpose of washing the disciples' feet in the sense that we are called on to do it, if I, your Lord and Master, have done this, you ought to do it, is for spiritual refreshment, not to get rid of dirty things. Although the Word of God is water and it does cleanse us, its primary purpose in applying the Word of God to others is not to straighten them out all the time, but to refresh them. And in the process, they can be cleansed. So looking at the first time something is used is going to be helpful very often in following that theme through the Bible. When we talk about full mention, we understand there are certain points in the Bible where the Spirit of God stops and says, I'm going to explain this fully. So we have examples like um, faith in Hebrews 11, or love in 1 Corinthians 13, or the gifts of the Spirit in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, or the church as a body in Ephesians 4 and so on. So there's full mention. There will be passages where the Spirit of God takes time to really carefully lay out these ideas. And then final mention, sometimes uh, the Word of God ties up an idea, so to speak, with a bow. It finishes off with a flourish. And so the last time something is mentioned is important. We see the invitations of God from the very beginning of the Bible all the way through to the end. And when we come to the last mention of come, it's a flurry. It's like the final fireworks, the final uh, salvo. And he says, the spirit and the bride say, come, let him who is thirsty come. Over and over again, there's this invitation, come, 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 as if God is saying, one last time, I'm going to underline it three times and put lots of exclamation points so you really get it. So sometimes the final mention of something is poignant. Sometimes it's expressive. Sometimes it finishes off. It sort of uh, concludes the idea. And these laws of mention can be overdone, but they sometimes can be very helpful. Uh, number seven, the obscurity rule. So the idea is that, like a jigsaw puzzle, you start with the clear edges they, everybody knows where those straight pieces go. And then you slowly work towards the middle. You don't normally start with a jigsaw puzzle with the pieces that there seems to be no context to them. So set the context and work toward the middle. And the more pattern, the more picture you have, the more clues you have to those last difficult pieces. And so it is with the obscurity rule. You don't start by trying to understand an obscure passage. You start with the plain and obvious things and then move towards those more obscure passages. And that's very helpful in Bible study. The cults are famous for taking obscure passages or uncertain renderings and making major doctrines out of them. So a baptism for the dead, for example, people aren't quite sure what that passage means. So the Mormons say, well, we'll make a major doctrine out of it then. So it's important for us that we start from the clear passages and go to the more obscure, not the other way around. And this uh, goes hand in hand with our next rule, the proportion rule, number eight. We need to understand that if God says something once, that's enough. It was my father's policy. I'm going to tell you this once. Uh, so if God, for example, tells us once about the head covering, that's enough. We ought to be obedient to it. Just like being born again is only once. If somebody says, well, the head covering is only once, I say, well, yeah, being born again is only once. But we want to take that seriously. So it's not that God has to say it more than once, but we should begin to try and follow the weight that God puts on certain doctrines in his word. So, for example... When we begin our Bible, God only spends a few chapters describing the creation of the whole universe. But he spends the rest of the Old Testament talking about one man and his family, Abraham and the nation of Israel. So obviously God's a people person. And the stuff is simply the temporary stage that God built on which to enact this drama of redemption. So there are some Christians, they, they can't get out of Genesis 1 through 3. Every time you talk to them, they got to talk about creation. Well, that's great, but let's get on to the new creation. That's the punchline. That's the point. 
And the Bible tells us, Jesus said, that one jot or tittle out of his word is more important than heaven and earth. Heaven and earth may pass away, but not these important details. So let's understand the proportion and when something is repeated over and over and over again, let's not miss it. For example, we can make a big deal out of the verse where two or three are gathered together in my name. It's a good verse. It's an important verse, primarily dealing with church discipline. But the most often quoted verse in the New Testament is, love your neighbors yourself. Maybe we ought to put a little more emphasis on that one because that's what God keeps repeating to us. Our next one is historical and cultural considerations. This can quickly be overdone. There are some preachers and they want to spend half their message explaining to us that uh, this king happens to be uh, Longamanus or, or the, the particular doctrines of the, of the uh, Gnostics or whatever it might be. If God felt it necessary for us to know those things so we could understand the passage, he would have told us. And there are some cultural and historical explanations that are found in the Word of God. They're essential to our understanding the passage. But, on the other hand, sometimes the culture can enhance our understanding of things. So if I understand what the Pharisees and Sadducees and Herodians believe, when I go back to Malachi, I'll see the seeds of those wrong ideas in Malachi. Malachi is going to be the beginning of a bridge that crosses over to the New Testament. And these sects of the Jews are already beginning to form during the intertestament period. And they'll help me understand why there was such opposition to the Lord Jesus. You could almost take the questions they ask in Malachi and hear them coming out of the mouths of the Pharisees and Sadducees when the Lord Jesus appeared. So there are some background details that are helpful, but I shouldn't simply interpret the Bible based on the cultural events. They're sort of like pictures on the wall. They're not the walls. And we shouldn't try to build doctrines out of cultural issues. People make a serious mistake, as I say, going to 1 Corinthians 11 and somehow making this a cultural issue. And they talk about uh, uh, prostitutes in Corinth that shave their heads. There's nothing, there's no mention of that. Instead, what we have are eternal principles. The headship of Christ, the glory of God, the observation of angels, and the establishment of the man-woman order in the creation. Those are all divine principles. They have nothing to do with culture. So people can use culture to explain away divine principles, to hide the truth. And that's a dangerous thing. We need to be careful of that. And then finally, number 10, dispensational considerations. Now, some people uh, panic when we hear the word dispensation and say, I'm not a dispensationalist. Well, you may not be a classical dispensationalist, but surely we have to accept that there are certain dispensations mentioned in Scripture. The dispensation of the grace of God, the dispensation of the fullness of times, and so on. What we're saying by this is that According to Hebrews chapter 1, God spoke in different times in different ways. He didn't treat Adam the same way before the fall as he did after the fall. And though there are some people who try to make them out to be the same, the Abrahamic covenant is very different to the Mosaic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant was a unilateral agreement. Abraham was unconscious at the time. He didn't have anything to do with the agreement. God took all the promises on himself, like the new covenant, where God takes all the promises. There's nothing I can do to break it because there was nothing I did to make it. Whereas the Mosaic covenant was a bilateral arrangement. The people said, all that you say to us, we will do. And so they were able to break the covenant that they had made with God. So understanding that distinction explains the book of Galatians. Galatians is explaining that Abraham was not saved according to the law, and we don't need to be saved according to the law either. So, understanding that there are distinctions. What we mean by a dispensation is a stewardship. At different times in history, God gave man a stewardship. He called man to a certain responsibility. 
Now, some aspects of those stewardships overlap different dispensations. So a dispensation strictly is not a period of time. It dominates a certain period of time. But for example, to Noah, he gave man the responsibility of executing the manslayer. God takes murder seriously because we are made in the image of God. And when you kill someone, you're killing someone made in God's image. Now that command, though it was given during that time of human government, continues on even into our age. So we understand certain aspects of these dispensations continue on to the end of time. Others of them were dispensed with and they pass away. And we have to make careful distinctions. And if we don't do that, we are not rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2, 15. So God bless you in your Bible study. Don't be overburdened by these things. This is scaffolding. This is not the building of truth. But as we seek to understand God's ways, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, that's how we understand the Bible. They say, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. How do you study the Bible? One verse at a time, one word at a time. But as we do, we see piece by piece the body of truth, the structure, this glorious temple that wisdom has built, and we come to appreciate that everything we learn teaches us something else because every truth is connected to every other truth. So everything I learn, I learn not only that truth, but how it relates to every other truth. Like a jigsaw puzzle, the more pieces I put in, the more I see of the overall picture. So be encouraged. Maybe you're just beginning. Take, take your time. Enjoy the journey. And may God help you as the Spirit of God who inspired the book is your teacher to reveal to you these glorious truths that not only inform us, but transform us to be like our Lord Jesus Christ.